Jenna, we're going to do a brief introduction, very brief introduction to epidemiology of burns injuries. I'm going to go through one, one case with the Slido with some audience participation and then do another case that are kind of illustrative for me of a couple of issues I've encountered with, you know, with um, managing pediatric burns patients. Um, and then we'll do a wee bit about understanding the pathophysiology of burn injuries and knowing the approach. I'll say what we're here for today is knowing the approach to the initial stabilization of the children who are unwell with burned injuries. Um, so very briefly, it's a very common injury presentation. Um, and, and children uh, overwhelm or you know, have a, a disproportionate amount of the burn injuries that present to EDs. And the highest incidence is not in the youngest age group in infants, the toddler age. And most, most commonly, we see scalds. And then after that, it's contact and flame burns. Chemical, electrical, and radiation burns are much less common in children. And it just this is just to illustrate that in terms of the, the sheer volume of burns injuries, the amount of, fortunately, the, the amount of children that suffer very severe burns and, and, and who, who some of the burns injuries are a, a small number of the, of the overall amounts who, who present. Um, the types of burns injury that we can encounter are thermal burns, scald or flame burns, and then there's contact burns with a hot surface, chemical burns from no noxious chemicals, electrical burns. And then in terms of what kind of tissues can be involved, there's dermal burns to so the, 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 the skin, the external skin, mucosal burns to any mucosal surfaces, and then more specifically, airway or inhalational burns. Um, D depending on the region, depending on, on where you work, there might be different indications for PICU admission, but I suppose generally that these tend to include any burns that are over 20% of total body surface area, over 10% total body surface area in the younger age group under two years old, because these children can be quite difficult to manage from a fluid perspective and kind of electrolyte monitoring and things. Any facial or, or airway burns and then burns that involve circumferential involvement of limbs or thorax uh, and perineal burns. Um, this is your normal skin structure that uh, we're probably all very familiar with looking at the textbooks. Um, what skin does, it's, it's your protective barrier. It has sensory function. It regulates your temperature and prevents loss of body water and, and um, uh, proteins and also has some innate immune function and also production of vitamin D. So obviously if you lose the, you know, the various layers of your skin, a lot of these functions will be lost. Uh, pathophysiology of the burn. So we talk about degrees of burn. So the first degree just involves the epidermis. Partial or intermediate thickness, uh, known as second degree, then involve the sort of this, the epidermis and the dermis. Progressing on to full thickness, which is third degree, which is right down kind of into the dermis and down to the adipose tissue. And then fourth degree is complete loss of the tissue right down to the bone. These are just pictures from um, this paper from 2019. So um, A is a you know a first degree burn, two is a second degree burn, C is a third degree burn, and then D is just a picture of, of the consequences for children who don't receive adequate burns care in those early stages. And, and from the paper, this child you know then received uh, good care from a plastics team and, and had a, a good functional recovery despite how horrific that picture looks, but sort of illustrates why it's important to get it right. Um, so I'll go through the first case is a case I was kind of involved with from the PICU side, um, not from the retrieval side. It was a 15-year-old patient brought in by ambulance from a house fire. There were two other children rescued from the scene. No significant concerns with those, but unfortunately there was one adult pronounced dead at the scene, um, presumably due to smoke inhalation. Um, the 15-year-old had been found on the floor, not breathing, and felt to be in cardiac arrest at the scene initially and received two minutes of CPR and bag blood mask ventilation with restoration of output, no drugs or shocks required, and then woke up and was quite competitive in the, in the ambulance. So first question for everyone is, who do you think should be part of the, the, the ED team? In addition to obviously the, the full ED team, who, who else should be present or who do you think should be present? So on arrival, the patient was conscious, competitive, but was known to be non-verbal with severe learning difficulties uh, and difficult to assess exactly, you know, their level of consciousness. And, and, compared to their baseline. They had apparent first degree burns to their lower face with soot present on the face and all their first degree burns and soot on, on initial assessment to the torso, to the arms and to the left thigh. They were also noted to be stridulous with hoarse vocalization and their sats were sort of in the low 90s with 15 liters of oxygen by a non-rebreather. They were tachycardic but kind of were well perfused and the paramedics had been able to cite two large bore cannulas um, en route. 
So the next question, uh, the next question I had set up was to choose the next management steps as a priority and sort of to pick out the two that I think might be most important that, that I'd suggested. But the two I would be thinking at this point in time would be to get some IV um, analgesia into this patient to try and calm them down. I would suggest sort of IV ketamine at an analgesic dose and also then to prepare for RSI for this patient to secure the airway as a matter of priority. So in this case, the patient suggests the patient given IV ketamine as analgesia um, while the anesthetic team prepares for RSI and intubation. RSI was undertaken with fentanyl, ketamine and rocuronium <clears throat> and the patient was intubated on a ventilator and on a ventilator with a coughed oral ET tube and there were suit stain secretions noted at the cords and at no initial difficulty with oxygenating and ventilating the patient and with further assessment possible with the patient now anesthetized they were assessed as 17% total body surface area, first degree burns in, in areas of her face, neck, thorax, um, torso and left leg. And they were estimated at 52 kilos based on their age. There was no kind of initial feeling of mucosal burns when, when they were the, the team were looking in the airway. So initial assessment and stabilization and burns. So at, at the top, because burns are technically treated, should be considered a, a potential trauma, C-spine precautions, obviously take a priority in terms of airway that look for all these signs of inhalational injury and suspect if you see things like the patient working hard, having strider, hoarse voice, um, burns around the face or neck and, and visible kind of um, sooty secretions that suggest that they've inhaled smoke or, or contaminated air uh, and injuries taking place in an enclosed space, like in such in this case is in the living room and, and in ext very extensive burns and in patients who have reduced consciousness. And the important part is if you suspect there's an airway involvement to intubate early, because the, if there's any edema present, it can progress and turn and, and the intubation become increasingly more difficult. And really, it should be the most experienced intubator available to do the intubation. Do you want your first go to be your best go? Because any kind of instrumentation, instrumentation of the airway might accelerate the edema. And uh, you want the avoid sucks for RSI and burns due to association with hyperkalemia. Uh, and don't cut the ET tube, but those are things that probably aren't really in common practice now anyway. Um, and think about how to secure your tube. You could do it with cotton ties initially if there's facial burns. And you want to make sure they're well oxygenated. Um, if they're anesthetized and ventilated, they'll need an arterial line. If you suspect carbon monoxide poisoning based, based on the history of sort of burns in a, in a furnished area in a, in a, in a small space, then administer 100% oxygen and check up an arterial blood cast to check the carboxyhemoglobin levels, a normal level being 1% to 3%. If there's a patient who has a persistent lactate elevation, uh, the other thing to consider is cyanide poison. So if this is an elevated lactate that's not responsive to resuscitation, that you've ruled out other causes such as hypovolemia, um, bleeding, things like that, then, then consider that and speak to the National Poison Service. And discuss an escherotomy, which is, you know, cutting the, the tissues of the thorax if there's re restrictive circumferential thoracic burns. Um, management of the breathing is really there's a risk of direct and indirect injury. So there's the direct injury from the smoke and the, the toxic fumes and the heat. And then there's obviously a secondary injury that can come from the inflammatory response and, and from uh, fluid resuscitation in, in all the way up to ARDS. Um, arising from pulmonary edema and also there's a risk of infection. So you want to adopt the lung protective approach to ventilation and um, with sort of your tidal volumes limited to physiological tidal volumes. You could use a pipe up to eight to try and keep the lungs open. Try and limit the pressures as long as you're allowing permissive hypercapnia and even to keep the oxygen below uh, 60%. Um, if in the absence of carbon monoxide poison, you can kind of now relax to 88 to 95% kind of oxygenation. Uh, this is just a bronchoscopy picture of suit in the airway. And uh, this is an escherotomy in a child who's had widespread burns. But you can see why that would be restrictive um, for ventilation. Um, in this case, the patient was, was stable from a cardiorespiratory perspective and was accepted for transfer to the regional burn center. Um, the local plastic team took the theater. Unfortunately, the retrieval team couldn't get the patient for several hours, so they were admitted overnight to the local um, adult ICU. So we wanted to see what things people thought might be done in the meantime and primarily what I'm getting at here is that the patient should you know have secure IV access should have their baseline all their bloods done um, including group and hold if they're needing any fluid resuscitation to get 10 mil per kilo crystalloid boluses um, titrated to response consider you know all they need for access and things and then most importantly calculate your ongoing fluid resuscitation requirements
So you can use these kind of, you can use the London Browder chart or the Mersey Burns app, which is restarted um, to try and calculate your percentage burns and then use the Parkland formula to um, work out how much fluid to give. So any patient with over 10% total body surface area burns will need the, the ongoing fluid resuscitation prescribed and will need a urinary catheter and monitor urine output. So currently the, the formula is three mils per kilo uh, body weight by total body surface area. You replace half that requirement over eight hours and the, the remaining half over the following 16 hours. And you must prescribe appropriate maintenance fluids with that containing glucose in children. Other things to think about are you don't need to give antibiotics routinely. Think about tetanus status. Think about safeguarding and potential non-accidental injuries. Um, going through the rest of the stabilization, uh, assess the GCS and look at pupillary response. If there is a consideration of trauma here, think about neuroimaging based on your history and how they present, whether they need a CT scan. Make sure you're measuring a blood glucose. Um, further, looking coming down the exposure, Anna, in the initial circumstance, if you don't have any IV access and you have a distressed child who's very sore and needs, needs to be calmed down to assess properly, intranasal analgesia, such as ketamine or fentanyl, or, um, depending on availability locally, can be used. Um, you get the loose clothing off and do a full survey once you, you, it's appropriate and do a good estimate of your burns extent and depth. But the full, really a full assessment in severe burns is probably going to take place in theatres by plastics with anaesthetics present. Keep them warm because they've lost that skin barrier. Children who've lost the skin barrier can get very cold. So you need to keep your ambient temperature up in the room and make sure keep the bear hugger on, make sure they're kept nice and warm. They will need a urinary catheter with hourly urometry and make sure to assess distal limb perfusion where you've got circumferential limb burns. Um, this is, uh, patients with extensive burns will be at risk of compartment syndrome in various compartments. Um, so in this case, the patient was admitted to the adult intensive care unit post theater um, pending retrieval, and they had a bronchoscopy, which lavaged out a lot of carbonaceous secretions and soot. Overnight, the patient became a bit hypertensive, and the urine output started to fall. They were estimated at 54 kilo and assessed 17% burns, but the total fluid being infused at the moment was Hartman's run at 165 mils an hour. And I, the question I was going to propose next was, what steps would you take? Hopefully, people are able to vote, but what I'm suggesting is that the patient probably needs a You'll need to do a full clinical bedside um, assessment of the patient, assess perfusion, we'll check the catheter's patent, make sure that that's um, working okay. Um, check a blood gas from your arterial line, look at the lactate, look at the hemoglobin, um, see how well perfused they are. Uh, consider repeating your bloods, your full blood count, your UNE. Um, and in the first instance, give a fluid bolus, so five to 10 mils per kilo and see how the patient responds. But really in thinking here, is there any other reason why this patient might be hypovolemic? Are they bleeding? Is there some missed trauma somewhere? Are they bleeding from somewhere? Um, uh, and or are they just running behind in their fluids? In this case, you know, so we talk about assessing the adequacy of perfusion. So looking at the pulse rate, looking at the pulse volume, um, looking at their blood pressure and kind of identifying acceptable parameters with the, the PICU consultant. You want your urine, urine output to be about one mil per kilo per hour in children for this. And if things like you want your lactate to be normal and looking at your base excess, checking capillary fill and consciousness. Now, all these things are, you know, measures of organ perfusion, uh, things that we use day and daily. Um, this is a suggested kind of approach to, um, from, a, from a recent paper in two, 2022 to change in your kind of hourly fluid rate. And depending on your urine output, it's for adults, but I, um, it, it makes sense in terms of uh, adapting it for the use in children as well. Um, management, so you, as I say, hypoperfusion might happen due to several mechanisms. Um, so you might have it as high insensible fluid losses from, from all the skin loss and capillary leak. Distributive shock because you get a surge response um, from and vasoplegia from the extensive tissue injury. You might get some cardiac dysfunction as part of that also. And then all the things you don't want to miss are the occult or unrecognized traumatic injuries. You also might have intraoperative blood loss and bleeding due to coagulopathy. And also, also these children lose a lot of fluid when they're in theater and when they're exposed before they get the dressings on. Um, so in this case, though, the resuscitation fluid has been prescribed appropriately, but they'd actually miss the maintenance fluid prescription, which is actually, I think, in my experience, a relatively common error in these cases. This patient also been estimated at 52 kilos, and when, when we subsequently weighed them, they were found to be heavier than that, I think significantly heavier than that. They were retrieved the next morning, ventilated and picked you for the further 48 hours with an inhalational injury protocol, um, and were neuroprotected based on the sort of brief cardio or uh, need for CPR, and then they were on a 
execute it on event on eventfully with a good recovery. Just a case to the second case, I just want to go through very briefly because I know I'm probably um overrunning slightly. Yeah. But About this is 10 a case, minutes, Damien, if that's 10 minutes. Okay. So just very briefly, I haven't included questions and it doesn't matter now because I've messed up the Slido. So um, uh, this this is a case where I was asked to retrieve. Um, so it's a, I, I had to go up and, and get them and bring them back to pick you. So it was a 14-month-old toddler. It was a pull-down skull, a freshly made coffee at home and had extensive sort of first and second degree burns to the face, neck, chest, arms and had been estimated initially as 12% total body surface area burns. They're a big, big kid. They were 17 kilos and they went to theatre in the local DGH following discussion with the, the regional burns team and went for debridement and dressings. And then were admitted locally to the paediatric high dependency unit for ongoing care and their resuscitation fluids. About 24 hours later, when they completed their resuscitation fluids, they became parexic, they became very tachycardic, they became tachypneic and, and developed an oxygen requirement. And the lact the, uh, a capillary blood gas was checked, which um, revealed a lactate of three. So they were discussed again with the regional burns team who then accepted for transfer. And then as the, as the, the retrieval service, we were called to kind of accept uh, to move the patient. Um, my initial advice was to give more fluid. So, so resuscitate further in case this patient was a bit behind in the fluid. So give titrates on fluid boluses, the heart rate um, and the gas. Uh, strongly consider in this case due to the pyrexia and the and the, the worsening tachycardia and the oxygen requirement that this child is intubated and ventilated with peripheral adrenaline probably running and at least having sort of pushed those adrenaline nearby just based on on the story that it was getting on arrival at the district general the, pa the patient hadn't been intubated at that point the team wanted to wait until we got there to assess to see whether we felt they still needed to be intubated but at that point they were in 15 liters oxygen by a non-rebreather saturated in the low 90s very tachycardic very, very shut down, looked peripherally and simply cyanose, were very pale and very listless looking. And we were repeated a gas, the lactate was now seven. So it was a no brainer at that point that we had to intubate and ventilate. And we used a very cautious induction with fentanyl, ketamine and rock. We had peripheral adrenaline, adrenaline running. We had loaded up with a couple of fluid boluses beforehand um, and uh, had uh, further crystalloid available, plus push dose adrenaline and arrest drugs all ready to go. Unfortunately, the, the child was relatively stable during the intubation. And then at that point, we inserted a central line, art line, and urinary catheter. The child had been started on keftraxone by the team locally, but we added in clindamycin. Thinking at this point, it, it seemed, you know, in terms of the timeline, 24 hours after the injury, and having had good burns care initially with um, debridement and dressing, that is unlikely to be infection, but given the possibility uh, of toxic shock syndrome and infection, we started on clindamycin. Blood pressure started to sag a bit more um, and started some noradrenaline before we left. And then we gave, I think in total, we gave 80 mils per kilo of crystalloid before we left and then I had more fluids on the plane. Um, we transferred by fixed wing aircraft back to PICU. And really, this is just to highlight something I've seen before, with particularly with smaller children. I think toddlers, this toddler group who have, a, have extensive skull burns can actually be more difficult to manage sometimes than, than realized in terms of their fluid resuscitation. What had happened here is that they, the, the, unfortunately, the local team had significantly underestimated the, the body surface area of the burns and it was revised to greater than 20%. So they were significantly under resuscitated. Um, they also, you know, they, they got some immunoglobulins and eventually had a good recovery with intensive care and with the specialist burns care. Um, in terms of management infection, because this is the other problem you might encounter with burns patients um, who come, haven't sustained their burns injury, gone home and then come back in, things you should think about are the things I've kind of described with that patient. So pyrexia, obviously, and then persistently deranged physiology, tachycardia, tachypnea, hypotension, obviously, being a, a fairly ominous um, thing in children and, with, and associated things that, pre, uh, that might come before that with reduced urine output, prolonged cap refill, lactate increase and worsening base deficit. And then other things to look out for, inflammatory marker trends that suggest infection, thrombocytopenia, coag going off, and then a rash, any feed intolerance or diarrhea that develops, blood sugar abnormalities, and then a patient who's becoming confused. If you suspect infection, blood cultures, cultures, every, everything that's in dwelling culture and, and do peripheral blood cultures, if they're tubed, blind bowel, and discuss promptly with the burns team and uh, start antibiotics empirically based on your sort of local protocols. If you suspect toxic shock syndrome, you know, the toxic syndrome caused by streptococcal or staphylococcal infection of, of, of 
burnt skin, the, you, you know, the, the triad is diarrhea, rash, and pyrexia with hypotension. And this is an emergency. You start the propion antibiotics immediately, including clindamycin, and discuss this case with the uh, infectious diseases team, as well, obviously, with your um, local pediatric critical care team. Um, just a wee bit about PICU management of burns. So traditionally, the mortality of burns was due to burn shock, so the hypovolemia that, that, that patients suffered and um, infection. Uh, and there's been massive improvements in survival and functional recovery with early aggressive fluid resuscitation and good early debridement of burns and clean dressings through, and, and repeated inspections to re remove non-viable tissue. And that non-viable tissue acts as a, as a medium for a growth medium for infection and a medium for continued uh, kind of widespread inflammatory response. And as part of that, then the PICU approach is sort of a multidisciplinary effort to try and support organ function in the, in the initial stage and then provide the best conditions for pain relief and encourage and, um, healing and restoration of function. And generally, your burns injury is separated in the, kind of these three periods, the resuscitation or A phase, where they get hypodynamic circulation, hypovolemia, capillary leak, and need a lot of fluid, so need, need judicious fluid resuscitation, might need quite a lot of fluid. And then once the, the, the wound is starting to be kind of, the, the skin's starting to be debrided, you, uh, you can go into, they go into this kind of hyperdynamic, hypermetabolic state with, can develop hyperpraxia, hypoten or hypo, hyperpraxia and like, uh, like a high cardiac output shock related to a, a systemic inflammatory response from the, the burns injury, which it can be hard to tell from infection. That's probably what was happening actually in that second case I described. And then the children will remain quite hypermetabolic for a good couple of years afterwards, and, and they need, you know, long-term ongoing nutritional support and rehab. Long list of citations here for people to go through at their leisure if they want to read more about burns care and, and management of burns. Uh, are you including first-degree burns in total body surface area? Um, uh, and then fluids in burns. Do we give Parkland in addition to routine maintenance? Yeah, so, well, I include first-degree burns. I wouldn't include surface erythema. And I think that's probably what happens sometimes if you've got a bit of erythema that you include, um, that, that that can be included as a, as a first degree burn where you have no kind of overlying tissue loss or skin loss, epidermal loss. And yes, we'd give maintenance fluids in addition to your parkland and particularly including the glucose. And I think some uh, the emission of the, the maintenance fluids is something that kind of you, I have seen kind of happen a, a couple of times and, and you kind of end up with then a bit of a confused fluid strategy in the onward management of the patient. This other question is a bit more for the ICU rather than ED, is about enteral feeding. Um, my understanding would be that enteral feeding would be quite important in these patients, but what would you do? I was just going to say, yeah, I didn't really include that part, but the, the previous talk that I've adapted this from was suggesting that, that once this patient goes to theatre, they should have a, a nasal, a patient like this who's complex, severe burn, should have a nasal jejunal tube inserted while they're asleep, whether they're going to be woken up again afterwards or not, because they'll need to be, they'll need, it's, it's a nutritional emergency. So they'll need dietetics input. They should be right. fed early and, and there should be minimal interruptions to any feeding. So the nasogeginal tubes so that you don't have to fast them every time they might need to go back to theater would, is what I would suggest. When and would you give steroid for airway ir burns? I personally wouldn't rush in with steroids, to be honest. You've not got uh, an, an airway swelling that you're thinking is going to turn around necessarily particularly quickly it depends on what you're dealing with um whether you're talking about peri-extubation whether you're talking about initial um burns presentation whether you're talking about the setting of superimposed infection so um i personally do not rush in with steroids for these patients because of the risk of infection given that you've lost potentially lost a good you know amount of skin barrier um, and then peri-extubation depends on the on what your patient looks like in terms of whether there's a cuff on a you know a cuff DT tube, a leak around the tube, whether there's any actual need for it. So um, patient specific, but I certainly don't see any uh, evidence base supporting their use. Yeah, I would have to second what Peter said there. I I think if you have strider and airway concerns, your answer is a tube, and going with steroids would be very dangerous in that situation um acutely um and also i'd like peter to be concerned about the infection risk as well um i suppose on the infection side um someone has also mentioned about the use of in immunoglobulin and why that would be considered so the treatment of toxic shock isn't it you know yeah, it's and the immunoglobulin come in yeah the case that i was referring to the, the patient probably was too soon for toxic shock but based on the history of hypertension and 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 high you know very high temperature 
it was discussed for the infectious diseases team who would normally, I think, in, in most circumstances, if we're thinking of a, a toxic shock type syndrome, we would speak to about whether immunoglobulins would be a benefit. But yeah, in my head, if you've got a toxic shock type picture, you'd want to throw everything at the child. And that includes um, clindamycin, which has its antitoxin effect, and then immunoglobulins, which also has a, a, a direct antitoxin effect. So that would be the rationale behind it. There is, there is very limited evidence for the use of immunoglobulins, even, you know, in toxic shock, depending on what the actual cause of it is, um, which is why we tend to speak to the ID team uh, in Glasgow. We, we sometimes find that it's, it depends, you know, which ID consultant is on um, because the evidence base isn't as robust as people might think. But if you've got a hemodynamically unstable patient um, who you're giving lots of fluid to and is hemodynamically unstable, is it something that I would support giving? Yes, personally. But I think there isn't a strong evidence base, so you'll find variation in practice.